right, thank you very much for joining me here today. I'm Don Ma. To start off, some China-related stories. It seems like the country has sought to cheat and steal its way to matching Taiwan in chip technology. This is according to the island's new envoy to Washington. And of course, this is drawing the Chinese embassy in the U.S. to hit back at the claim, calling it false and ill-intentioned. Take a look at this report. Taiwan's new envoy to the U.S. on Wednesday accused Beijing of cheating in the chip-making race and stealing technology as he backed Washington's export controls against China. The U.S. has been working with allies to cut off China's access to advanced chips and chip-making tools that could fuel breakthroughs in AI and sophisticated computers for its military. In an interview with Reuters, Taiwan's representative to Washington, Alexander Yu, said the export controls are necessary in dealing with China, known formally as the People's Republic of China, or PRC. He argued that the West's attempt at getting the country to follow international rules by letting it join the World Trade Organization didn't work. We have found out that PRC doesn't really play by the rules, and, and they cheat, and they steal technology, etc. So by imposing these uh, uh, measures uh, towards PRC, I think is is needed, and also it's an effective way to hopefully uh, make PRC uh, comply by, by these set of rules that we all follow. Despite the curbs, recent reports say Chinese chip makers expect to make next-generation smartphone processors as early as this year. But Yu cast doubt on whether this was viable, saying China has tried for years to reach Taiwan's levels of success in the chip-making industry. They've hired executives, engineers, uh, large numbers of them to try to uh, form their own company and replicate uh, the, uh, the production facilities of capabilities uh, from Taiwan but they, they haven't been able to do so. You arrived in Washington in December to take up the role as de facto ambassador, replacing Xiaobi Kim, who's now Taiwan's vice president-elect. You told Reuters he's found overwhelming bipartisan political support for the island, and he hopes Congress will pass a recent Senate bill that's offering allies billions of dollars to fend off Chinese aggression. Any means that helps Taiwan better protect itself or defend itself or to acquire more uh, military hardware uh, is, is welcomed. However, the bill is tied to thornier issues such as U.S. border security and as being stalled by Republicans who want tougher curbs on immigration. And now I want to take a look into how Apple has been doing in their relationship with China. Could China's growing economic struggles lead to any serious effects on Apple's sales? And TV Sharm Marshall has a look at the numbers. Does Apple need China? At one time, China was just a small part of Apple's total sales. But in just 10 years, China went from being a tiny part of Apple's profits to becoming a huge one, accounting for almost 20% of the company's total sales. Ben, we've been in China for 30 years, and uh, I, am, I remain very optimistic about China over the long term. In the shorter term, analysts are increasingly worrying about sales of Apple's signature device in China, whose economy is navigating the burst of a real estate bubble. Apple is challenged with China. I think consumer discretionary as a whole, it may be more challenging as, uh, you know, as consumers perhaps slow their spending. The iPhone also faces increasing competition in China and has fallen out of favor in government offices. Along with the absence of a foldable device in Apple's product line, which is a popular and fast-growing segment in China. A number of factors have led to a decline in Apple's sales in China, with sales nosediving by 13 percent in the quarter ending in December 2023. China remains to be the world's largest smartphone market and the potential for future growth in the region is still significant. Sean Marshall, NTD News. And at the same time, it seems like a major Chinese company is not doing so well these days. China's Alibaba Group Holding on Wednesday missed analyst estimates for third quarter revenue. And 
It's hurt by softness in the retail market and sagging economic recovery in the world's second largest economy. Take a look at this. Alibaba failed to meet analyst expectations for third quarter revenue. The Chinese e-commerce giant was hurt by softness in the retail market and China's weak economic recovery. On Wednesday, the company reported revenue of nearly $36.7 billion for the three months ended December 31st, slightly below analyst predictions. Alibaba is under pressure from slow growth in China's online shopping market following the end of health crisis restrictions. Consumers in the world's second largest economy have cut costs in response to the slow recovery. That's helped more low-cost domestic players like PDD Holdings, which own Pinduoduo. It has also led Alibaba to focus more on discounting and lower-priced goods. However, Alibaba did announce an increase of $25 billion to its share repurchase program through the end of March 2027. Last year, Alibaba announced the split of its business into six units. Group CEO Eddie Wu will help oversee the move. Wu took over the role in September. He's told staff the company's strategic focus would be user-first and AI-driven as it fights slower earnings growth. Now on to markets. Wall Street's major stock indexes rose on Wednesday with the benchmark S&P 500 registering a record closing high. And this is as investors applauded overall strength in the U.S. earnings. Here's a quick recap of markets. The S&P 500 hit another record closing high on Wednesday as Wall Street's main indexes rose thanks to strong corporate earnings results. The Dow added four-tenths of a percent, the S&P 500 gained eight-tenths, and the Nasdaq climbed roughly one percent. More than 80 percent of S&P 500 companies that have reported earnings so far have beaten profit expectations, LSEG data showed. But it's the forward guidance that's been particularly encouraging, says Brian Mulberry, client portfolio manager at Zacks Investment Management. It is starting to kind of separate a little bit of the quality companies versus some that might not be in a, such a good position. And, and really for us, that's going to be those companies that have low debt levels, good organic growth metrics, better margins at the end of the day. We're starting to see those companies co combined with better forward guidance get better treatment in terms of price appreciation in this moment. Shares of Walt Disney, flat at the close, climbed in after-hours trading after the company handily beat Wall Street's expectations, lifted by record results at its theme parks and continued cost-cutting efforts. The entertainment giant also announced a $1.5 billion stake in Fortnite maker Epic Games. Shares of Arm Holdings, which finished up 5.5 percent, skyrocketed after the closing bell when the British tech company forecast quarterly sales and adjusted profit above Wall Street expectations as its customers aim to design new chips for artificial intelligence. Shares of Chipotle gained more than 7 percent after the Mexican chain restaurant topped analyst estimates for quarterly profit and sales on strong demand for its burritos and rice bowls. And Ford shares rose 6 percent as the automaker increased its first quarter dividend and scaled back investments in loss-making electric vehicles. Now, the Super Bowl, as we all know, is right around the corner. So let me talk about this. Companies are spending several million dollars for just a 30-second commercial during this year's Super Bowl. Is it worth investing all that money? Here's a look at the craft behind making a successful ad and how these companies are grabbing our attention in such a short time span. Some people watch the Super Bowl for the game, others for the commercials. But unlike the players, these companies have seconds to grab our attention. It's a massively competitive playing field when it comes to advertising because everyone's showcasing their best spots. Kellogg marketing professor Derek Rucker says companies are shelling out $7 million this year for a 30 second ad during the Super Bowl. It's a costly investment. So how do you make sure you get a return on that investment? Some commercials this. make us laugh. Help. You can't touch this. While others pull at our heartstrings. Hey Google, show me photos of me and Loretta. If you introduce a problem for which your brand is the solution, that can be very powerful. Rucker says some companies will use jingles. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. 
or celebrities. Nationwide's there to protect. Uh, maybe leave the songs to me. To grab our attention. But it's important that consumers still remember the product and not just the ad itself. Then there's the companies that simply have an iconic image that represents their brand. Like Anheuser-Busch. For Budweiser, the Clydesdales may be just as recognizable as their beer. I think they resonate with people so much because they're not only this amazing brand symbol of strength and determination and quality, but they're also just so captivating. Anheuser-Busch releasing one of their ads early this year. Let's go! Telling CNN they hope this ad is a nod to their long history with the big game. So no matter which team gets to hoist the Lombardi trophy on Sunday, these companies are hoping they're winners too. Now, we're seeing major economic moves by North Korea. The country's Supreme People's Assembly has voted to scrap all agreements with South Korea on promoting economic cooperation. This is according to North Korea's official KCNA news agency on Thursday. This, of course, as the two Korea's ties continue to deteriorate. Here's what you need to know. North Korea is ending all economic cooperation agreements with South Korea, including a special law on the operation of the Mount Kumgang Tourism Project. The North's state media reported on Thursday that the country's parliament voted to scrap all such agreements. The decision comes at a time when relations with the South continue to deteriorate sharply. South Korea's unification ministry, responsible for inter-Korean relations, said the move was not surprising and would only deepen Pyongyang's isolation. An official added that Seoul does not recognize the unilateral move. Mount Kumgang lies on North Korea's east coast, just beyond the demilitarized zone separating the two countries. A tourist resort there was one of two major inter-Korean economic projects the other being the now-scrapped Kaesong Industrial Zone. There had been important tools of cooperation between the two sides in the decades of tension following the Korean War of 1950-1953. Hyundai Asan, an affiliate of the Hyundai Group conglomerate, which invested more than $564 million in developing the Kumgang project, declined to comment on the report. KCNA separately reported that came on Wednesday toward factories producing consumer goods and food and gave guidance on modernizing the facilities as part of implementing a new regional development policy. A state media report last month said Kim Jong-un had called for ways to be found to improve the North's economic development, saying a failure to provide people with basic living necessities, including food, is a serious political issue. And back here in the U.S., Target is considering launching its own version of a paid membership plan like Amazon Prime or Walmart Plus. The retailer is trying to find ways to compete against its biggest competitors and grow sales. This comes as Target has faced months of decline as consumers scale back spendings. Now, sources say internally it's going to be called Project Trident. And the new program could launch as early as this year. The new program would go beyond Target's current free loyalty program, offering other benefits and requiring a fee. Some sources say it could also incorporate Shipt. This is the grocery delivery business the company bought years ago. Now, by some measures, consumer confidence is actually up, and so is consumer spending. But it's not without consequences. One generation of Americans are particularly strained to start 2024. Take a look at this. Three years of high inflation plus higher interest rates to tame it have equaled more financial stress on the American consumer, especially when it comes to credit cards. More people are carrying more credit card debt for longer periods of time. We're talking record high balances, record high interest rates. It's a tough combination, unfortunately. A report released Tuesday by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York said credit card balances rose to a new high of $1.13 trillion in the final three months of 2023. And credit card and auto loan delinquencies pushed past pre-pandemic levels to their highest levels in more than a decade. Researchers at the New York Fed believe the post-pandemic resumption of federal student loan payments has added to the financial stress, particularly for people ages 30 to 39. Bankrate senior industry analyst Ted Rossman says he'll be looking closely at the New York Fed's next report in May. 
Typically, credit card balances fall in the first quarter of the year. In 2023, they did not, which can be a troubling sign about consumers' ability to keep up. People always have this enthusiasm about New Year's resolutions and debt payoff, and you knock out that holiday debt hangover. Last year, people really weren't able to do that. And that was largely because of high prices and high rates. And I do worry that we may see some of the same this year. Meanwhile, a study by the New York Fed has found that U.S. wealth inequality has grown worse in the post-pandemic recovery. The New York Fed found that black households are now worse off than they were before the pandemic. The study used data based on values of household assets as well as liabilities. Researchers found that the net worth of white families are up 28 percent since the start of the 2019 pandemic. Hispanic households grew 20 percent, but black families dropped 1.5 percent. The New York Fed attributed the outcome to changes in the value of financial assets and noted black households' wealth was more heavily concentrated in retirement holdings. And Mayersk said today that Red Sea trade disruptions would not be a major boost for the company and an oversupply of vessels would hit its earnings this year, sending its shares sharply lower. Here's more. Maersk shares fell sharply on Thursday. The Danish shipping giant stock was down 13% in early trades after a new update spooked investors. Maersk said Red Sea trade disruptions would not be a major boost for the company, even though the crisis has driven a surge in the prices to ship freight. It also said an oversupply of vessels would hit its earnings this year. The negative mood contrasted with recent optimism about the sector among investors. Shipping companies have been some of the best performing stocks in Europe so far this year. Firms have rerouted vessels following attacks on shipping by Houthi militants along the major Red Sea trading route, driving the gains in freight rates. Maersk has diverted some vessels on a longer route around Africa. But it expects underlying earnings of between $1 billion and $6 billion this year, well below the near $10 billion it scored last year. Maersk further said it expected significant oversupply challenges in seagoing container shipping to emerge fully this year. The warning led the company to suspend its share buyback program. Maersk said it would review the decision once market conditions in ocean container shipping had settled. Another blow to trouble the New York Community Bank Corp. The bank's new executive chairman tried to reassure investors, but the bank's shares fell another 12 percent yesterday. On a call with investors, Alessandro Dinello said that overall deposits are up from last year and all areas of the company are performing strong. He said the bank has strong liquidity and a strong deposit base to stay afloat. But NYCB stocks have been hemorrhaging, shedding about 60 percent of its value over the past eight days. And on top of that, Moody's Investors Service downgraded the bank's credit grade to junk while J.P. Morgan dropped the stock from overweight to neutral. Much of NYCB's problems are concentrated with its commercial real estate portfolio. Now, a bit of news on Walt Disney. Its CEO, Bob Iger, hit back at activist investors on Wednesday with a slew of announcements, uh, including a splashy investment in Fortnite maker Epic Games and plans to launch an ESPN streaming service in 2025. Here are the details. Walt Disney is biting back at activist investors. On Wednesday, the firm set out a slew of new plans. That includes a $1.5 billion investment in Epic Games, the maker of Fortnite. The two will work together to make a Disney universe, where players can interact with some of the firm's famous characters. Disney also gave more details on the long-awaited launch of a streaming service for sports channel ESPN. It will debut in August next year and will include features including fantasy sports and e-commerce. The plans were all set out by company chief Bob Iger. He said the gaming deal marked the firm's biggest ever move in the sector and would offer major growth opportunities. Iger also revealed plans for a $3 billion share buyback and said the dividend would jump 50%. The news all sent Disney shares surging nearly 7% in after-hours trade. Analysts say it's all a response to pressure from shareholders, notably including activist investor Nelson Peltz. He's been pressing Disney to deliver profits from streaming that are on a par with Netflix and has demanded more details on plans for ESPN. 
However, the moves failed to impress his team. A spokesman said, we saw this movie last year and we didn't like the ending. For the quarter just gone, Disney beat forecasts for profit, helped by new attractions at its theme parks. But the Disney Plus streaming service lost 1.3 million subscribers after a price increase in October. Now here's something interesting. An array of unconventional privately funded plans to exploit the moon, including as a site for human ashes and sports drink containers, has gathered steam in recent years as NASA pushes to make Earth's natural satellite more accessible. Take a look at this story. There's a new legal debate about the moon that started with human ashes and a can of Pokari sweat. They were among the items on a recent private moon mission by U.S. company Astrobotic, which ultimately failed to reach the moon's surface. What they were planning to do with the Japanese sports drink is unclear, but the trip had raised legal concerns about the proper use of the moon amid an array of unconventional, privately funded plans to exploit it. No one country has jurisdiction over it, so how should it be governed? Right now, there are no U.S. laws or standards outlining what's acceptable on the moon's surface. That's an issue that'll gain more attention, as NASA increasingly leans on private companies to cut the costs of its trips to the moon. NASA says it has no control over what private companies put in their landers either, but says payload standards could be created in the future. Lawyers with space law expertise worry that the absence of regulations will not only make the moon a target for contamination and litter, but also spark international disputes. Few countries have adopted standards for moon behavior, and the rules remain unclear in international law. Another private U.S. lunar lander is due to launch next month, and the lack of rules risks bringing Washington in conflict with the widely ratified 1967 Outer Space Treaty, according to lawyers. That pact says countries must authorize and supervise the activities of non-governmental entities. That raises the stakes for the space industry, the Biden administration, and lawmakers who have battled for months over how to regulate novel commercial space activities, with industry groups resisting what they call innovation-stifling regulations. One entrepreneur says overly restrictive regulations could, quote, destroy an industry before it gets off the ground. And we're seeing a double blow to fast food chains as war and inflation take aim at their sales. Shares for the parent company of Taco Bell, KFC, and Pizza Hut is seeing significant headwinds. Yum! Brands reported weaker-than-expected sales in the fourth quarter, with Pizza Hut's numbers sliding and KFC sales flat. Price-conscious consumers have been ditching drive throughs That's because just over the last year, dining has surged more than 5%. Now, a bit of earnings. Japan's Nissan posted a lower-than-expected 6.4% rise in operating profit in the December quarter, saying today that it will maintain its annual outlook as a more profitable product mix offset a lower full-year vehicle sales forecast. Here's more. Nissan's profit accelerated in the latest quarter, but not as quickly as analysts expected. The Japanese automaker said Thursday operating profit was up 6.4% in the December period. It totaled almost $952 million, but that was well below analyst forecasts of more than $1 billion. The auto giant kept this year's forecast for operating profit at around $4.2 billion. It believes a money-making product mix will help offset a lower full-year vehicle sales projection. Nissan revised down its retail sales outlook for the current financial year to 3.55 million vehicles. It had previously expected 3.7 million. Nissan said the lower sales numbers reflect growing competition and logistics issues around the company's key markets. Its global sales grew 4.6% to some 3.3 million vehicles last year. A stronger performance in North America and Europe offset falling demand for its cars in the world's top auto market, China. Sales there fell 16% last year to fewer than 800,000 vehicles. And SoftBank Group today posted a net profit of 958 billion yuan. This is around $6 billion. This is in the October-December quarter, ending a streak of four consecutive quarters in the red. And this is as the value of publicly listed investments gained ground. Take a look at this. 
SoftBank has snapped its losing streak. The Japanese investment giant said Thursday that net profit hit $6.6 billion over the latest quarter. This time a year ago, it posted a loss of not much less. The numbers ended a run of four straight losing quarters. It's been a tough few years for SoftBank. Many of its investments in tech startups fell in value as interest rates rose. That forced it to slash its buying and sell off assets. The setbacks tarnished the reputation of boss Masayoshi Son. He made his name with big calls, including taking an early stake in Chinese e-commerce titan Alibaba. Almost all of that holding had to be offloaded as SoftBank finances turned sour. Some other later investments also went very wrong. SoftBank poured money into office sharing firm WeWork, only to see it rack up losses and eventually file for bankruptcy. Analysts say Son's firm now takes a more cautious and disciplined approach to selecting investments. Among its crown jewels is a controlling stake in UK chip designer Arm, which has surged in value by 40% over recent months. And that's it for today's NTD Business. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next week.